Uh, hi everyone, uh, my name is uh, Andy. I am a developer, I'm from Australia, so I apologize that I won't be able to speak in Chinese. I won't be able to speak in Mandarin. Um, so today's presentation is on security, security 101, security fundamentals. So before we start, just very quickly introducing myself and my colleague here. I'm Penny, I'm a developer, I'm from ThoughtWorks Australia. I've been working in ThoughtWorks for eight years now, more than eight years, and primarily as a developer. Throughout my career, I had the opportunity to travel and work in different countries. I've worked in five different countries, Australia, uh, the US, Brazil, Thailand, and, and this year I'm in China. I'm in China for one year, so I've been here for six months now in Xi'an, so I'll be here for another six months until, up until July, July 2019. Um, and here is my colleague, uh, Daruri. Hello,大家好,我叫邓德瑞,首先我要更正一下 我们今天讨论的这个主题是 呃，这个是我们。哦，你们你们两个人需要像说相声一样站在一起。哎，一个麦克风，一个麦克风有有帮助吗？你觉得？不确定，这个不确定。那我们试一下，你试一下，咱们可以测试一下。请没有麦克风
why do you want to use a model? So from the previous example, you know that when I try to describe the characteristics, it's difficult. People might have different ideas what it is. Whereas if I show you a model, when we have a model, it's easier to communicate. So why do you use it? It's because it's easier to communicate. Now, when you have this picture, or maybe if you have a small statue of this, uh, of this object, it's also easier for you to reason about or to think about. Let's say you want to answer, you're, you're about to go to a different gallery, and you say, I want to showcase a statue. But again, if you describe the statue, then the owner of the gallery might find it difficult to imagine what you want to show. But if you, want, if you show this picture or you show a small scale, then the owner of the gallery would say, okay, I understand, it's about the size of a person. And then they know, oh, it's probably better to, you to display it in this room. And it's probably better to display it with a, a certain amount of space. So it will be easier to think about the object. It will be easier for you to analyze the object by having a model. So let's go back to a threat model. What is a threat model? It's exactly the same thing. What is a threat model? It is a representation of a threat or a representation of a danger. It is also an example of a security risk. And most importantly, it is not the real thing. So a model is not the real thing. A threat model is not the real thing as well. I want to showcase that because, or I want to highlight that being important because if it's not the real thing, then it's not going to be perfect. So it's only going to be dependent on your thinking and your assumptions. So this is only one way you can think about security. Why do you want to use threat model? The same reason. It will be easier to explain security risks. If you want to communicate security considerations to other people, if you have a threat model, it's much easier to explain to them. It'll be also much easier to analyze risk. How do you actually gain from threat model? It will be easier to identify, to list out all the security concern. It will also be easier to prioritize, which means you can choose which of the dangers that you want to tackle on first. And it will also be easier to strategize, which means you can plan when you know what the security risks are, then you can have a plan on how to handle the security risks. Now that we've covered the definition of a threat model, I want to introduce you the way to think about security. And it's going to be just two, two main points here, the way to think about security. And I'm going to start with a story. A QA engineer or a tester walks into a bar. This is just a joke. This is not a real story. I, I hope everybody knows what a QA is or a tester. So a QA engineer walks into a bar. He orders a beer. And then he orders zero beers. And then he orders 999 million beers. And then he orders a lizard. And then he orders minus one beers. And then he orders a random piece of string. So it's a, simp it's a, it's a silly example. It's a joke, obviously. Because a QA, what they do in companies usually, they try to test different scenarios. They try to test edge cases. So in this case, if the bar is the application, then the QA try to, to test out different things that you can do in a bar. So that is what is important with the security mindset as well. I believe QA actually have a really good skill to think about security because they try to test out and they try to think about how the application is used, but most importantly, all the edge cases and how is the application going to behave when it's used in a way that it is not meant to be used. So try to put in large strings, large amount of data, large amount of different type of people trying to hit the system, what's going to happen. So the first mindset here is to think about threat model, you need to think creatively. You need to think outside of the box. How can, actually, how, how can you actually approach the application or use the application in a way that you never would imagine that it would be used? So think creatively. Now let's go, go on to the next mindset or the next frame of mind. And to do that, we'll start with an example again. Try to answer this question. What are the security features of your apartment? 
So if I ask this question, most people would say, I have a high fence around the apartment. I have a gate in front of the apartment. I have 24 seven security in front of the apartment. I have cameras and the cameras are infrared cameras. So at night I can still see people going in. I have locks on the door. And even not only locks, I have RFID that has camera that I would be able to figure out. This is typically how people think about application, about security in terms of like, okay, what are the security features that my application have or my system have? I would like to try to shift your thinking into slightly different because this is not a very effective way to think about security. What if we try to answer the question instead of trying to answer what are the security features of your apartment, try to answer the question, how do I get access to your apartment? If we try to answer this question, then one way that we can get access to your apartment is I can disguise myself as a delivery person. When the door is open, someone is trying to go into the door, I can just follow that person in. Or I can disguise as a cleaner and I have access to your apartment block and I can have access to your apartment building. Notice that in those three scenarios, none of the previous security ma features matter because this circumvents all of that. And this is the frame of mind or the thinking that you need to take on when you think about security as well. Think like a criminal. Think like your enemy. How are they supposed to attack your system? Because they're not going to try to do the most difficult thing. They're actually going to try to do the easiest thing to get into your system. I'm going to pass on to Duroy to talk about some of the definition that would be important in security. Think like a criminal. 我想这是我们在威胁模型中一个安全心态中一个最重要的事情我们在之后的那个三圣中我们会cover几种重要的security model 然后我们会看到通过这些security model 我们如何像犯罪者一样的心态去分析一个问题然后来发现我们系统中存在的问题但是在这之前我需要先介绍一下这个安全模型中所依赖的几个重要的概念 他们是assets, threats, vulnerability和risk Assets,它的中文含义是资产 那在这个安全模型中呢 它就是我们需要保护的资产那它可以是任何很多东西比如说一个计算机一个数据库甚至是用户的敏感数据第二个概念叫做threat威胁它是执行工作攻击行为的个体那我这里需要强调它并不是一个攻击行为本身而是一个执行攻击行为的一个个体那它可以是人也可以是一个物体它可以是一个黑客那它也可以是一个病毒甚至是一个炸弹第三个概念叫做vulnerability它的意思是
It's the thief in this case. What is the vulnerability? The vulnerability is the fact that the safe is open, or maybe the owner forgot to lock the safe, or the lock is insecure. So that would be a vulnerability. So what is the risk? This whole situation is risk. The scenario, the story of a thief stealing a money, that whole thing is a risk. That's when you have the threat, the asset, and the vulnerability together, that is a risk. So another way to think about it is by drawing a Venn diagram. So you have threat, like a list of different potential people or different actors that could attack your system. You have assets, all the things that you want to protect, and you have vulnerability, all the things that could go wrong in your system. The intersection of all three of them is what we consider a risk. When you have an asset, a threat, and a vulnerability where they overlap, that would be considered a risk. We're going to go back to this diagram over and over again throughout this, uh, throughout this session because it's important for us just to uh, have an ability to understand how to think about this security-wise. So let's introduce the first threat model. So throughout this session, we're actually going to introduce you three threat models. This is the first one. The first one is called asset threat mapping. And the exercise that we want to do is to identify all the assets that your system or your application has and identify all the threats. And this exercise is done by doing brainstorming. So usually what we do, this exercise is done as a group. So you would invite your BA, your product owner, your business analyst, your QA, your developer. You sit in a room and you spend about 20 to 30 minutes together and then we discuss about the things that you have. So first you need to understand what is it that you want to protect and who is going to potentially try to perform an attack towards your application. So this is going to be just an example. For every application, for every system, it's going to be different, especially because different domain and different type of business will have different threats and different assets. This is quite common, but I would encourage you to do it yourself. So after about 10 or 20 minutes, you might come up with this list. The assets in this case, for example, would be the infrastructure or computing power. For example, if you have AWS or you have Google Cloud, all the servers that is, uh, that is in the cloud could potentially be assets because people want to have computing power out of that. Your code would be asset. Sensitive information, like personal information, Share this one. Sensitive information, like personal information, would be assets as well. Your logs could also be assets, and APIs with access to your data could also be assets. What about the threats? So obviously, hackers would be threats. Um, competitors, other businesses could be threats as well. Security researcher, people who just want to find out about your system, or bug bounty hunters. Data broker. These are people who steal data and sell it to someone else. And ex-employee, people who used to work in your company but now no longer work with, with your company. Current employee could potentially be threats as well because they can be malicious and they can steal stuff. You have script kitty or low-skilled hacker, or it could be a nation state like a cyber warfare. This is, a, um, if you imagine a company like Sony, they got attacked by South Korea. That's a whole country becoming a threat towards a, a, a company. Now this exercise, once you've done it, is going to be the foundation for the next exercise that we're going to do for the asset threat mapping. So we go back to this diagram. That exercise that you just do, brainstorming, is actually identifying this circle over here. You identify threats by brainstorming and identifying this circle here. You identify assets by brainstorming, identify threats by brainstorming, and identify assets by brainstorming. So what is the asset threat mapping? This exercise is once you have all the assets and all the threats that you've brainstormed, you now do the exercise of connecting them together. So you come up with this map. This is your first threat model. So for example, the data broker here. Let's say you say the data broker is one of your threats. And then you start thinking, if the data broker is threat, what would this person or this actor be interested in? What assets would they be interested in? 
because they want to sell data, then likely they'd be interested in your API because they want to get access to your data. They would be interested in any sensitive information, personal information the customer has. They might also be interested in your logs. So in this case, you can see that you can map the data broker to logs, API, and sensitive data. So then the arrows signify motivation, the arrows signify interest, the arrow signifies for a threat, they might be interested in looking at some of your asset. And you do the same exercise pretty much to all the assets and all the threats. Once you have that, you now have this picture. This is your threat model. Remember what threat model is for? It's for communication. Now you can go to your team, your product owner, to other teams and explain to them. These are our threat model. These are what we are considering when we consider our security. These are the people that we want to protect against or the actor that we want to protect against. And these are the assets that we want to protect against as well. We're going to use this threat model to actually create another threat model later on. So we're going to go back again to this Venn diagram. Remember the first exercise is to identify the threats by brainstorming and identify assets by brainstorming. The asset threat map is really this intersection like right over there. That's the asset threat mapping. All right, Daru is going to give a summary real quick on the exercise. Thanks, Wendy. Uh, 我来简单的总结一下 assess threat mapping 这个微型模型。首先，它的目的是帮助我们分析我们整个系统中存在的威胁和资产。那那在这个威在这个威胁模型中，第一步呢，我们需要首先呃整个团队成员聚集在一起讨论呃头脑风暴。来识别系统识别我们系统中存在的所有的资产和威胁。那么作为下一步，我们的系统呃，我们的团队成员又需要在一起讨论。那在这些 那可能大家会问，那这个威胁模型有什么用啊？建建立出来以后，那实际上虽然它本身并不会给我们直接的带来action，也就是说我们并不能从这张图上识别出就是哪些问题、哪些弱点，我们需要去修复的。但是它却可
So that becomes the root of the attack tree. The root of the attack tree here would be to get the source code. So once you identify the goal, you put it at the root of the attack tree. So that's step number one, identify the asset, identify the goal, put it as the root of the attack tree. The next step is that you discuss with your team how are you able to get access to your source code. And that, could, that will become the first nodes or the first child of the attack tree. The first child here is you can get it from the internet. You can get the code from the internet, like just by Googling or Baidu. You can get the code by having access to the developer's computer. You can get the code by trying to get access to like a GitHub user account, for example. Or you can get the code by exploiting or using the GitHub API. Or you can get the code by trying to get access to your build server or build agent. Because usually you would have Jenkins or Circle CI, and that's the machine that compiles and do tests or your code. That means the code would live there. That means they don't, an attacker might not need to attack the source code repository or the developer's computer. They can just attack the build server or a build agent to get access to your code. That's just an example. Now, out of this five different parent nodes, the next step that you want to do is to decide which one of these are most likely, the most likely. So in this case, I've already sorted it, sort it out. And just an example, let's say the most likely one is the one from the internet, the one on the far left and most. Then you try to explore again. If you want to get the access to the code from the internet, how would you actually do it? In this case, you can either do it by searching, just put a search term, or you can try to, let's say you know one of the de developer and they have a GitHub user account, you can try to search all their gist, any public repository or any type of code that they publish online. You can try to see if that developer has a Dropbox or any type of file sharing system and you try to investigate any of their file sharing system and see whether the code is unintentionally put there. Or you can also try to see their blogs. Maybe they blog about their system and maybe they put their code there. Now for each of this leaf or bottom node, there's going to be an action item. So if you can, if as an attacker, you can look at someone's blog and have access to your source code, then the action item would be quite obvious. Remove the source code from the blog or have a policy. Make sure that we never publish the source code in a blog. Similarly, Dropbox or any file sharing system, make it a policy that you're not, you should never share your code using Dropbox or using a file sharing system. So each of this leaf, firstly, is a story. Secondly, it becomes an action item or a backlog for your company or for you to action on. Another example here, let's say the way you have access to your code is by the developer computer. Then you ask the question again, how do you get access, not to the code, but how do you get access to the developer's computer? Because it's one step and one step, right? So you can steal the developer's computer, you can borrow the de developer's computer, or you can use the developer computer without that person knowing. An example here would be, let's say you're in the office, you're typing something, and then you need to go to the bathroom or the toilet, and then you leave your computer unlocked. Somebody can come in and use your computer without you knowing. So that's an example as well. Again, for each of the leaf, the bottom note, that becomes an action item. How do you prevent a laptop from being stolen? Or if a laptop has been stolen, how do you make sure that the code won't be accessible after it's being stolen? For example, encryption of the hard drive, strong password, or remote wipe, all of those kind of things you can do. So you pretty much do the same thing for all the other nodes. And now you have an attack tree. This will be your threat model number two. Once you've done it for one asset, you actually are going to need it to do it for all the other ones as well. The tip that I would like, the advice that I would like to give you is if you have limited time, try to do it, like try to do the most important one work first and try to do it in small chunks, like 10, 20 minutes. Usually I would pick, instead of the code, I would pick this one or whatever it is in your threat model, in your asset threat map that has the most arrows because that indicates the most likely 
type of asset that everybody wants to attack against. And that's the one that you want to analyze first. I'm going to show you back to the diagram and really what we're doing with the attack tree because we've done oops, we've done threats and we've done assets. And essentially we do that by brainstorming and then we've done the asset threat mapping, which is the intersection between them. Attack tree is, but, is to identify vulnerabilities. Each of the leaf is essentially mm -hmm. vulnerable. I'll pass on to Jury for a bit of a summary. Fendi, you just told us a new threat model called Attack Tree Threat Model. The process is that the first step is to use the ISIS Threat Model and choose some assets as our target target. Then we will use the Threat Model to identify the threat model by the whole team and the whole team to identify the threat model by the whole team. 来寻找，如果我们要攻击这个 assets， 那我们有哪些具体的一些做法可以做？那这是一个脑洞大开的一个状态。那最后我们会识别出尽可能多的攻击的方法。注意，这应该是一些呃 major category。那然后随后呢？那我们再去看，那我们想到了这么多的东西，那有哪个 category 是最有可能的呢？那我们就选择它做进一步的方，呃，进一步的头脑风暴。那如果我们要用这种方式，那有哪些更具体的做法可以实现这个目标呢？那这一步我们可能会做，呃，做很多次，直到我们最后得到的，得到了一个最后的叶子节点。那它就是一个非常具体的，呃，能够攻击这个系统的方式。那这个叶子节点实际上就是我们我们这一步，呃，我们这个叫 tree attack， 呃 ，tree attack， 呃，威胁模型的结果。那它首先是。我们系统中可能存在的一些 vulnerability， 那其次呢，那这些 vulnerability 那实际上也可以被我们放到 backlog 里头，也就是说我们未来可以花 effort 去修这些问题。好，那这就是 attack tree。呃，那除了 attack tree， 还有另一种呃 threat model 是我们介绍的第三个 threat model， 它叫 stride threat model。在介绍这个威胁模型之前，我觉得有必要先介绍一下什么是 stride。stride 这个词儿是一个英文单词，但它实际上在这里是六种威胁的六个单词的一个缩写。那它是微软的几个工程师在一九九九年的时候他提出来的。他们发现，在自己的团队中，用这个模型来分析，可以有效的发现一些 vulnerability。那这 stride 这六个字母的意思又是什么呢 ？Spoofing 伪装，就像芬迪刚才举的例子，如果呃一个小偷他伪装成一个清洁工，想混进一个小区，那他这种行为就叫做伪装，那就是他试图变成一个他本来不是的一个东西，从而骗过某些安全检查。那第二个第二个词语叫 tampering 篡改，那他是利用某些已存在的东西。那比如说，你跟一个网站，呃，它有，它有一些网络请求，对吧？那可能攻击者会去在这个已知的合法的网络请求的基础上去修改一点点东西。比如说，他可以不断的尝试去修改一点点东西，去看怎样，呃，他可以达到他的不法的目的。那这就叫做篡改。那第三个叫 repudiation， 抵赖。那什么是抵赖呢？抵赖它往往是跟。呃，跟日志系统相关吧，就是他的想法是，呃，当一个人他用某些手段，他去迷惑了，比如说日志系统，他让日志系统不能记录他的一个某些非法行为的话，那他事实上就可以在某些不好的事情发生以后，他对别人说，我没做过这个事情，不是我做的，那这个攻击行为就叫做抵赖。第四个 ，information d i s c l o s u r e 顾名思义，它就是信息泄露的意思。那每一个系统中，它都会有一些敏感的信息。那如果你把这些不该泄露给别人的信息泄露给别人，那他可能会根据你这个信息来猜，可以能猜出来，就是你背后可能是用什么逻辑实现，比如说你用哪家数据库啊之类的信息，那他就可以，甚至可以用这些信息作为一个攻击你整个系统的突破口。Deny of service， 拒绝服务。那我们可能经常听到一个词儿叫 DDoS， 它就是 Deny of service 的一种。那就是它可以通过一些手段，呃，来制造一些，比如说大流量去攻击你的系统，让你的正常功能无法无法运作，那它就属于 denial of service
。那最后一个 elevation of privilege， 攻击者他他可以尝试用一些做法，比如说他原来只是一个来宾账户，那他设法获得了一个 user 账户，甚至一个管理员账户，那他就可以做更多的事情。那还有一种就是你可能是一个 user 账户，那你试图去，呃，去让你能访问，比如说其他 user account 才能访问的东西，那它就是一种提升权限的攻击。那现在我们 cover 了这呃这六个比较 thread 的这六个概念，那它实际上是 thread 模型呃 thread 呃 thread model 的一个基础。那 Fendi will tell us more details about this. So first, it's spoofing. So this is a, a funny example. Obviously, it's not Starbucks; it's Star Fox. But the, I want to illustrate the idea of spoofing. This, the idea of spoofing is fake, essentially. So this is not the real Starbucks; it's actually a fake Starbucks, and it calls it Star Fox. And in our industry, one of the ways that people can do this is trying to pretend. To be a legitimate server or a legitimate website. Here we have two websites, both iCloud, but one is actually at www.icloud.com. The other one is on a separate server altogether, but they look exactly the same. So then, if you're a user and then you didn't realize where you are, and then immediately as soon as you see this website. And you entered your username and password. You can imagine what would happen. Essentially, the owner of the server is now having access to your username and password, and they can do stuff with your account, or they can impersonate you. So that's an example of a spoofing. This is a similar example of a spoofing, but in this case, this is not Apple. This is actually this is an actual case. This is a bank in Brazil, and the top site is the real site. This is the real site, and the address there is the real bank address. The bottom one also has the same address, but this is the fake site. So how does this? How does the attacker do it? It's because they actually have a virus and they have compromised or they have attacked the user's computer. What happens is when the user opens up Chrome, the virus activates and replaces the window inside Chrome with its own program. So even if the address bar shows the real website, the one the window inside the Chrome is actually the fake one. It's an Internet Explorer, and it goes to a different site. And the similar danger occurs as well. So people actually found out when they right click. When you right click on Chrome, it shows like that, and when you right click on Internet Explorer, it shows differently. So both examples actually show you spoofing from the server side. So the attacker trying to create a fake server, but spoofing can work both ways. Spoofing can work from the user side or the client side as well. So you can pretend to be a real client and trying to trick the server. The next bit is tampering. So what I want to illustrate here is the difference between spoofing and tampering. Where spoofing is fake. Tampering is modification, or tampering is change. The first one is the original picture. That's the original picture. It's just a dog、um, running. And then the second one is the modified modified picture. It's not necessarily fake. It's modified. It's changed. So that's tampering. When you have something that's genuine, and then you try to change a little bit and to see what happens. I don't know if you have ever ordered a package before, and sometimes inside the package you would have this seal, and then if someone has already opened your package, then you would know because it has been opened before. That means what's inside the package might no longer be real. What's inside the package might already be swapped or stolen, and this is also a form of tampering, and that actually applies to software development and IT as well. Because the request that you send to the server or the response that you get from the server goes through the internet, and you have no idea whether someone actually has tampered in the middle. This is just an, a physical example of that. So now I'm just going to show you this. So this is just 
showing you the different HTTP header that a browser usually sends to the server when it makes a request. Host header, refer header, user agent. And if you expect the application to behave normally, like a, a browser, then you expect this to have the correct value. But one of the lessons as a security person is that you can never trust your user because any of this HTTP header can be modified. So either the user themselves modify them or right in the middle, someone tries to modify this header and try to do something else. So if your business logic actually depends on any of these HTTP header, then you might want to think twice on how to change it. The next one is repudiation. Again, the concept here, what I want to highlight is about shifting blame. The picture here is about a dog pulling down the Christmas tree and then said, it's not me, it's the cat, the cat did it. So that's actually shifting blame or essentially trying to de deny something, trying to say that it's not your fault or trying to change the integrity of logs or audit. Repudiation is actually quite important. It's important enough that the issue of repudiation has gone to the top 10 of OWASP. So the Open Web Application Security Project lists out the top 10 most important security issues in uh, web application security. And since 2017, the idea around repudiation, which is insufficient logging and monitoring, has entered to the top 10, becoming the number 10 uh, most, uh, most important issue. The idea is you need to be able to trace and diagnose whenever your system is <clears throat> under attack. Usually when an attack happens, big companies, when you hear in the news that there's a large security breach, that large security breach doesn't happen in one day. That large security breach happens over time. When a hacker comes into your company and want to attack something, they don't attack the database directly. They would come in and try to attack the least secure thing that is present in your company that you don't even think about. The first thing that they, they will attack usually is the printer. They will attack the printer. They will attack the old computer or the old server that nobody ever touched because usually that old computer or old server has not had any security updates and therefore they got, they got in. And then once they have a little access into your company or in your network, then they start to increase their access. If you don't have logging or monitoring, that means you're giving time to the hacker to do more damage. So that's why this is important. Essentially, you want to make sure that you have knowledge or you have information when someone tries to break your system. I'm not going to go through this details, but there's going to be more information here. I just want to highlight very quickly what to include and what to exclude. The things that you want to include in your information logs and monitoring will be timestamp, access logs, all the information that would help you in understanding what is happening with your system. And equally importantly is what to exclude. You want to make sure that you don't log sensitive information. Because if you log sensitive information, then the attacker now have a different place to get sensitive information, which is log your logs. These are some best practices around logging. You want to make sure that you sanitize the output, which means you just make sure that you don't have any crazy characters or any sensitive information. You want to make sure that you have integrity. So timestamp is a good thing. Also to restrict the access so that nobody can modify the logs so you can trust the log information and credibility. And usually it's a good idea to have some sort of reporting. So it's a good idea to have structured logs because it will be easier to analyze. Next is information disclosure. <laughs> so this picture here is a, a, a child playing the game hide and seek. And obviously this child, both of them failed because it's obvious where that child is. One is hiding behind the crocodile doll. The other one is hiding inside a box, but the box is transparent. What we want to explain here is that as a company, as a system, there are sensitive information that you want to hide. And sometimes, unintentionally, 
you might leak them or you might give them away. This is a recent example of Anchor CMS. It's a framework for a CMS. This is from 2017. And what happens in this case is when it does logs, it also logs the password to the database. Obviously, that's not a good thing because then you can use the log to find out the password and then be able to access your database. <laughs> There's more examples than this. Sometimes your application or your system, you might not realize that you log sensitive information, credit card numbers, payment information, name, age, date of birth, personally identifiable information, and you log them or you cache them in the browser, in the cookie, whatever. But when you do that, what's happening is that you are actually giving away information similar to this, unintentionally giving away information. Next is denial of service. So this is to illustrate the concept of overload, right? So you imagine your server as the donkey, you just put so much load on it that the donkey is not able to serve the request anymore. So that's the idea of denial of service. I'm just gonna play this video real quick. I don't know if it's... So what this video is, is an actual attack in 2013 of the site VideoLAN VLC. What happens is on the left hand side is a distributed denial of service attack. There's many, many machines on the right hand side. Oops. There's many, many machines on the right hand side trying to make a request to a single server. And over time, because there's just overloaded with requests, then you're going to see, it's not obvious here, but you see red dots over there. The red dots represent failed response. It just says uh, timeout or service unavailable. Right. I'm just going, this is an animation. I'm just going to let it play out for a bit. So what this shows is load balancing inside your application or your network or your architecture. And this shows the scenario of cascading failures, which means one failure leads to other servers failure. And this could happen in your application or your system as well. And what I'm trying to highlight here is for a denial of service attack, sometimes they don't have to attack your entire system. Sometimes they only need to attack one server. And because that one server failed, then that failure spreads to a different server, and that failure would spread to even more server. So the thing about denial of service, the way you think about it is, it's about how you architect your system to make sure that it's performing optimally, but also to consider scenarios like this. How do you prevent one failure from actually spreading across your entire system? This is another example, and you're depending on what your role is. If you're a developer, you might be familiar with it. It's called the N plus one query. So usually what will happen is, is in a SQL database, you try to uh, query select, in this case, trying to select pets. And then if you list out all the pets, like a dog, a cat, and a bird, and then each of the pets have an owner, like the dog is all owned by A, the cat is owned by B, and the bird is owned by C. But the owner usually doesn't live in the pet table. So in order for you to get the owner name, you need to make a query to the owner table. So instead of making one query to the pet table, you need to make four queries. One query to the pet table, and another query each for the pet owner. So obviously, if you know this uh, in the developer world, this is not efficient. What we're trying to highlight here is that one request could potentially create a lot of requests. And if you have these types of issues in your system, again, an attacker could come in and they don't have to do a lot of things. They just need to do one or two requests and they can still bring down your system because of these types of issues. 
Let's go to the final one, elevation of privilege. And I'm pretty sure you've seen this dialog box before. You go to Windows, you're about to delete a file or you're about to install a program and the Windows box pops up and says, are you sure you want to do this? So by clicking yes, that's actually what we call elevation of privilege. So this is not an attack, this is just an example of increasing your privilege from a user to an admin. If you, you, you are used to Mac or Linux in terminal, you know there's a command called sudo, which increases your privilege from a user to a super user. So su, that's the same thing. In order to describe elevation of privilege attack, I need to describe two more terminology. One is authentication and the other is authorization. And the difference between them, authentication is trying to answer the question of who you are. So let's say you are a security guard and then someone comes to you and say, hi, my name is John. You as a security guard, you can't just immediately trust this person. You don't know who these are. And usually you would ask, give me your ID. So then John would give the ID and says, okay, there's a picture of John as well as the name John there. That is authentication. That is trying to answer whether or not that person is really the person that, that, that he or she said. The next one, is authentication, and it's trying to answer the question of, of what that person is allowed to do. Let's go back to the example. John comes in and say, hi, I'm John, this is my ID. I want to enter the building. And then as a security guard, then the question that you want to answer is, is John allowed to go into the building? Is he allowed to go into the building? That is to answer the permission of John. Now, I want to go back I want to emphasize this too because the elevation of privilege attack actually tries to attack both of this. You, you elevate your privilege either by faking your ID, by pretending to be someone else, by, by attacking authentication, or trying to attack authorization by trying to get more permission that you're supposed to. So in a side, an example here will be, let's say, it's a guest user. Let's say you have an e-commerce website and you only allow member, registered member to purchase something from your site. A guest user is not allowed to. And then the elevation privilege attack will be trying to increase your privilege from a guest to a registered member. Equally, if you're already a registered, registered member, the elevation of privilege attack will be how to increase your privilege from a registered member to an admin user or similarly from a guest user to an admin user. Let's go through the exercise real quick. Now that we have the definition of all stride, how do you actually use this as an exercise? So threat model number, number three. Usually there's already tools on the internet and you can buy them online as well. These are cards, so you play them as a card game. The left hand side is from Microsoft. This is called the elevation of privilege card game. The right hand side is from OWASP, it's called the Cornu Co-PI card game. You can choose either one, but if you have access to this, then you can play the card game to run the threat model exercise. The way you do it is first you need to draw an architecture diagram or a data flow diagram of your application. This is just an example and it's quite common. Usually you have different client trying to access your site and then you have a web server the web server talks to an identity manager and eventually it's going to pass in request to application server and you have different message queues everywhere. You start with an architecture diagram and then you move on to play the card. Let's say you play a card here, the three of spoofing. Here it says an attacker could try one credential after another and there's nothing to slow them down. So this is essentially a brute force attack. Somebody just try a different username and a different password. And you try to think about, against your architecture diagram, does that apply? So you talk, about, you talk about it with your team. Hey, can we actually try a different username and password? Are, are they going to be locked out? Is the identity manager, does that have any way to detect any of this? If it doesn't, then maybe you want to start thinking, can we rate limit? So prevent someone from brute force attack. So that becomes a to-do list, to-do item here. 
So we need to introduce rate limit. Let's go through another example. An attacker who gets a password can reuse it. So if a, a password is stolen, could an attacker come in and go into your system? Let's say, okay, yeah, that's correct. That means you want to introduce yet another to-do list item there. Maybe we need to introduce two-factor authentication. It's another example. Your system ships with default admin password and doesn't force changing. So let's say you use a framework or a library and then inside the framework it has an admin interface and then maybe you forgot to change the default admin and password so it will be just admin admin and then that becomes another to-do item just to check hey maybe we need to check our default credentials making sure that it's been changed we're just going to go through the last example here your code make access control decisions all over the place rather than a security kernel so you go through your, your different uh, application server, you look at your architecture diagram, and you discuss it. Do we have permission control at every different application server? And is it central at one place, or is it distributed at different places? If it's distributed, then may, you, may be, you might have a problem, because if you want to update security, that means you need to update three or four different servers, and you might forget to update one or two of the server, and that's a bug. And that could be something that an attacker would come in. So maybe you want to introduce another item in your backlog to do is to centralize authorization. So this is how you run the exercise. You have an architecture diagram, you play the card one by one, and you discuss it with your team. I'll pass on to Drury for a bit summary. 刚才我们首先介绍了一下Stride。Stride它是六种常见的安全问题的一个缩写。分别是 spoofing, 伪装, tampering, 篡改, repudiation, delay, information disclosure, 信息泄露, denial of service, 拒绝服务, elevation of privilege, 提升权限 那在实际的这个thread这个威胁模型那又是怎么进行的呢 它会是一个卡片游戏可以选我们会把这个卡片发给所有的这个团队成员在我们的这个系统中我们可以做什么呢就可以完成这个卡片上说的这个东西那最后呢我们会得到一些漏洞我们的结果会是一些漏洞那其实这个 这就是Stride uh, Thread Model. Okay. So very quickly, back to the Venn diagram. We've done the identify threats, identify assets. We've done one thread model, which is the asset threat mapping. And then on the bottom, we want to identify the vulnerabilities. And to identify the vulnerabilities, we have two other threat models. One is by using the attack tree exercise, and the other one is by using Stride, the one that we just explained. OK,所以说我们总结一下我们今天讲的东西 那第二点呢，通过这个威胁模型，我们可以将团队成员聚集在一起，大家进行头脑风暴的方式来帮助发现我们系统中的问题。同样，那这个这种团队活动也可以帮助整个这个团队提高这个团队成员的这个安全意识
，我们介绍了三种主要的威胁模型 a s s e t Threat Mapping 模型，它能够帮助我们识别出我们系统中所有的资产，还有它相关的呃威胁，并且我们把这个资产和威胁的这个相互关系可视化出来。第二个模型 Attack Tree 模型。那它和第三个模型 Stride 模型一样，它的目的是帮助我们识别出我们系统中存在的漏洞。那识别出来这些漏洞，我们就可以再进一步的去呃分析它们的优先级，并且着手解决。那由于时间问题，我觉得我们对这三个模型的介绍还是比较简略的。那如果大家对更多的细节感兴趣，其实互联网上有很多的资源，只只要搜索这几个。关键词就可以。呃，这就是我们的呃 presentation 的全部，谢谢大家。谢谢呃，大家有什么问题吗？It seems like the, this kind of modeling and this kind of uh, analyze is applied on the back end. And, and my question is uh, applying to the front end. For example, we all know that there is an uh, NPM attack, which is in, uh, in the uh, last year. How can we apply this? Can we apply this kind of, uh, um, this, uh, this kind of framework or this kind of method to the, uh, to the client side uh, vulnerability ch uh, checking? So, uh, take take that question as an example. Uh, can we an, uh, analyze these kind of risks, of, uh, such, a, such as NPM uh, model attack, to one of these guidelines? Okay, I I want to ask. He just asked about the risks. 呃，他可能可能我们介绍的比较多的例子，他可能想到的是这些东西是不是都是在后端进行的一个。<咳>建模分析，那能不能在前端来做这样的分析？比如说前一阵我们出了一个 NPM 的一个事故，比如说大家应该知道吧，那个 NPM 的那个事情。对，然后就是想问这块有没有呃，我们是不是也可以对前端也这样做 ？At least one of the model would be useful, the attack tree, and、uh, we actually have an example of that when uh, because in 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 my project in I, I try to introduce threat model both for the back end people, the front end people, <coughs> also the QA, because they this is good to actually have in your mind. When we do the exercise with the front end people, we do the attack tree exercise, and then the the goal is to、um, the goal is trying to steal credit card information. So that's the root of the attack tree, and one of the way you can actually steal them. One of the people said. Or maybe we can do it by Chrome extension, because、uh, the Chrome extension we can can then be able to have access to your website, can read everything, and potentially steal the credit card as well. Another one is third-party JavaScript, because if you don't validate your third-party JavaScript, this is not npm. This is just using a third-party framework that doesn't come from npm, like Maximizer or something. And it, because you don't have access to the code, you don't know what the JavaScript is doing. The JavaScript could read anything inside your page in HTML, and they could send it anywhere. That's also a, another attack. And then we also discuss maybe it's an NPM NPM attack. What would what would happen if someone put in a poisonous package, and that poisonous package is used in our application? We don't realize that that's a poisonous package, and then it tries to grab all that information and put it somewhere else. So yes, we use the attack tree, and we find out that yes, NPM. Attack is one of the reasons that it could be used as well. I think we can use Stride as well because the spoofing, tampering, repudiation, information disclosure, denial of service, and elevation of privilege also apply on the front end. And you can, but it's going to be slightly different. The example that I give you is back end because it's quite common, but you can use it for front end. Yeah, I want to fund it. He just answered the answer yes. We can do this on the back end as well. 实际上，在我们的项目中，我所在的前端团队中，我也尝试过用那个 attack tree 模型和 stride 模型，在团队内部组织过一些活动。然后我们发现，确实大家集思广益的力量是巨大的。就是大家在一起讨论的时候，确实能想到一些可能平时没有注意到的东西。那它也帮助我们前端识别出了
我们现有的这种架构中存在的一些问题。呃，谁如果还有问题，可以用中文提问。I can translate。嗯。Okay, translate. <笑>我用中文了啊！<笑>我看到刚才有那个小卡片儿，卡片我从哪里可以得到？呃、uh, ，Where can we get the card game? So it's it's free, available from Microsoft. You can download it. Both 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 of them are free, so you can download it from from Microsoft and AWSP. Yeah, it's just a PDF file, so you can print out yourself or go to a printer and print it out yourself. 我有一个问题，就是这个这个资产，就是资产，就是我们保护资产有没有什么优先级？就是可能我们会会有很多资产需要保护，但是我们精力有限，我们怎么去确定这个优先级 ？Any priority on the assets? How to decide which assets are most important? Yeah. So I'm gonna go back here. <coughs> Just as an example, let me just show you the picture again. This one. This is just an example, real quick. I'll present from here. So one of the once you have an asset threat mapping, one of the way that you can use it is to use um, this, for example, because it has the most arrows. So if you want to spend more time on it. That's probably the thing that you want to investigate or analyze first. The arrow indicates interest or motivation, and the the red box indicates threats. That just means sensitive sensitive data means er, there's a lot of threats that actually wants to attack your sensitive data or different things. So if you want to prioritize, maybe that's one way you can prioritize. You look at this asset threat mapping and look at which one are the more likely that people are going to attack. Thank you. 我还有我还有一个新问题，就是我最近也面临一些就是安全上面的问题，呃，但是我之前不了解这个安全方面的知识，我不是无从下手。呃，我今天就稍微有得到一点启发，我想问一下，如果我想继续深入的了解，有没有哪些网站或者社区可以去提问这样 ？Okay, if we want to learn more, on any resource on the internet or tutorials we can use? Yeah, I. I, I highly recommend um, if you are a developer or um, someone who's starting it out. There's different websites. I'll show you one right now.、Uh, I don't have internet.、Let's、see if I can have internet. I'll show you later. But、um, the Notepad,、uh, Wordpad. Sorry, I'm gonna type it out. Just because it's probably easier if you read it out instead of um. Okay. Capture the flag exercises. So capture the flag is an exercise where you try to attack a server essentially. So there are different websites on the internet that trains you. To be a hacker, essentially trying to start thinking like a criminal, and that's a good exercise because that gives you more information on how a criminal think or how a hacker think. What are they trying to do to gain access to your system? And I think that would be a good start. And it also is a good discussion with your team if you found out that your application or your system is vulnerable because of these type of attack.、Um, the website. That I would recommend <coughs> let me just over the wire dot o r g. That's good. If you want to search the search term, this is a good place to o w s a s p, which is the Open Web Application Security Project, and This is one that I really really like. Natas CTF、uh, or Natas captured the flag. That's the、um, the simulation, the, the attack simulation where you go to the to the server and you pretend that you're a hacker and you try to attack the server. 
，它是一个闯关式的游戏，而、呃、从简单到难。Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Do Do you have any other resources that you can share with everyone else? Um. Have a PHP 的项目 ，PHP 的一个平台，名字叫啥我就忘了，但是一搜一个就能搜出来。是一个类似于拿凡斯这样通关的一个平台，这一关一关往下，它都是一些 PHP 的漏洞。捕捉到这个漏洞之后，你可以走到下一关。你能知道他的网站的名字吗？嗯。后边又查出来，你把他的群。还有人有问题吗 ？OK， 那非常感谢今天两位讲师的精彩演讲。